having a private practice in San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Croft is the medical director of the San Antonio Psychiatric Research Center, where he's participated in more than 60 clinical trials. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Harry Croft. Are we okay? All right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to be here today uh, talking with you about a topic that I hope will interest you as well. Uh, some of you may know I did television for 20 years. Television has the power to entertain us, but also inform us, both positively and negatively, unfortunately. I didn't realize how powerful it was until I had a patient, a female attorney with obsessive compulsive disorder. And she came in, diagnosed her, and I said, you need therapy and medication. She was cool with the therapy, didn't want the medicine. And she came in week after week uh, and wouldn't take the medicine. And then one day she comes in and she says, okay, I'll take the medicine now. And I said, well, great, what made you decide to do it? She said, I was cooking dinner the other night and I had the TV on in the other room and there was a doctor on the news that uh, talked about this disease you say I have, OCD, and the doctor on TV said, to get better quicker, you need therapy and medication, so I'll take the medicine. <laughs> the doctor was me. Uh, she, she was in the other room, didn't see me, and, and that's when I realized how powerful TV is. Well, I'm not on TV today, I'm talking to you in person, but I'm talking to you about a topic that I'm really passionate about, and I hope by the end of this hour, you will become more comfortable with, and that's combat-related post-traumatic stress disorder. I love working with uh, Primary Care Net because they come up with these pearls, or they ask you to do that. And so here are the pearls. We'll show them again at the end, but this is basically information that I hope you get. If PTSD is suspected, ask the four PTSD screening questions. We'll talk about what those are. In addition to providing pharmacologic treatment, refer for psychotherapy if you don't do it yourself. And I'll talk about what psychotherapy is, where it's available, how it's done. Number three, create a strategy that identifies specific treatments for specific symptoms and comorbidities, and I'll talk about what those comorbidities are. And then finally, when caring for someone with PTSD, it's important that you remember and you get over to them that at its core, PTSD is a biologic condition with emotional, behavioral, and physical symptoms, and we'll talk about what those are. So why should you even care? After all, most of you don't work for the VA. Why should you as a civilian care? One, these vets are suffering. If you've seen them in your practice, you know how much they're suffering. And number two, those who care for and about them, their family, their friends, their relatives, their fellow employees are suffering too. And number three, you can make a difference. And I want to make sure that I make clear that I'm not expecting that you will become an expert in treating PTSD. Many of you I know don't have the time. Certainly, I didn't have the education, even in psychiatry, about dealing with PTSD. So I don't expect that you will become an expert in all the therapies. I just want you to know about them. So if a patient comes into your practice, you can recognize what's wrong with them and help start them on the right track. And chances are, you're already seeing them in your practice anyhow. You just may not know about it, and I'll explain why that is in just a minute. So, let's start with the first question. According to recent RAND reports, the percent of troops returning from deployment in Iraq and Afghanistan from OIF, Operation Enduring Freedom, and OEF, uh, or uh, 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 Operation Continuing uh, uh, Freedom, uh, deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan suffering from PTSD is approximately how many? 5, 10, 20, or 40%? Please. Uh... Well, 
talk about the answer in just a minute. So, PTSD in combat veterans. Uh, approximately 20%, according to the studies, come back with PTSD. Now that number ranges from 10 to 30%. Uh, and, and there have been, in Vietnam, there were about three, three and a half million veterans who served during that time. In this war, the wars in the Middle East, about two, two and a half million veterans. So there's a lot, and then there are a lot of things that I've learned in my work that we don't even know about that have gone on or are going on in the world. But what about the VA? Aren't they supposed to take care of these vets? Of course they are. And by the way, the present VA is not our grandfather's VA. It's different. There are a lot of differences, especially in mental health. But there's still problems, and one of the problems is some of the vets are not eligible. Some don't want to go. They've heard bad things, and they don't want to go. And they just avoid it, like the plague. In some cases, there's not a VA close by. In other instances, uh, prior experiences with the VA, and we see this especially in the Vietnam vets, who went right after Vietnam and basically got blown off and said, I'll never do that again. Things have changed. Finances, there are actually charges for some VA services. Appointment times, if you're working, it may be inconvenient to go to appointments at the VA. And the complaint I get a lot is the staff. You know, the kid I'm talking to wasn't even born when I was fighting in Vietnam. The lady I'm talking to has never been in combat. How could she understand what I'm going through? Or the other one is, I, I open up my heart, my mind, my soul to this therapist, and then I go back three months later and they're gone. And I gotta stop all over again. And there are other reasons. However, the VA is still the place to go and I'll describe it. Let me tell you why I'm talking to you about PTSD. 1973, I was in charge of the Army's drug and alcohol program. Many of you remember Vietnam ended formally in 1975. And tragically, in 1973, we never lacked for people to fill our substance use disorder beds. And almost all of them, all of them, all of them had what we would now call PTSD, but it had no name in 1973. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, got its name formally in 1980. But more important than not knowing what to call it, we didn't have a clue what to do for these poor souls that were coming back. And so we gave them a lot of useless information, stuff like stop smoking all that dope, stop drinking so much, stop being angry all the time, get some friends, socialize a little more, get a life, get a family, get a grip. And we knew that wasn't good advice, but we had no better advice. Fast forward to 13 years ago. I started doing disability evaluation on, on evaluations on veterans with PTSD. I've now seen 7,000 such veterans. And, and because of my interest in PTSD, which dated back to the 70s, not only did I gather the information, I actually listened to what these vets had to say and their family members. And I realized they didn't have a clue what was wrong with them. And so I wrote a little manuscript and I gave it to the veterans and they they called me back and said, how did you know me so well? And I said, I didn't know you, but I do know about PTSD, and that's what you have. Out of that manuscript came this book. This is the cover. Uh, I Always Sit With My Back to the Wall, which is a book for veterans and veterans family members to help explain PTSD. I learned in my work with veterans is that there's a lot of misconceptions about PTSD. And one of the biggest ones is this one. It's just a scam to get money. That's all. There's nothing wrong with these guys and gals. It's just a scam to get disability payments. 
If you've seen these veterans in your offices, you realize it's not a scam. They're really hurting, and it's affecting their whole lives, and I'll show you that in just a little bit. Another one of the misconceptions is that PTSD is all or none. You either don't have it or you have it. It's kind of like pregnancy. The reality is that there's mild, moderate, and severe, and very severe PTSD. And many patients have very mild symptoms. They have it, but it's very mild and, and it's treatable. Almost everybody returning from the combat zone has it, you've seen the data, only about one in five actually come back. And there's a lot of controversy. Why those one in five? What's different about those? Is there some genetic difference? And one of, we don't know yet, but one of the things we know is that those that went into the military who had had trauma in their life prior to going to the combat zone, we're more likely to develop it in the combat zone. Not universally true. There are many who had perfect growing up uh, and still develop PTSD. And it only affects those in direct combat. So those people that shoot uh, or get shot at are the only ones that get it. There are more causes of PTSD than direct combat. For example, one of them is the aftermath of a battle. I can't tell you how many veterans, especially guardists and reservists, I've talked to that said, you know, Doc, I was in artillery. I was a pilot. I was, I was dropping bombs from up there. I was shooting mortars. And I didn't realize until we walked the streets after the mortars and the bombs at, at what devastation there was and what it looked like to see people in conditions like that, especially women and children, so the aftermath of a battle. Non-predictable threats. This is a different war. This is a different war. The enemy doesn't wear uniforms. You don't know who they are. And in fact, right now in Afghanistan, we're not fighting the enemy, we're doing peacekeeping, which is a different mission for the military than, than what they're trained for. There are threats to even non-combatants. I remember a cook told me, hey doc, I'm a cook. I was in the cook tent. Hell, I don't even have a weapon. But that IED, uh, improvised explosive device that came over the wall and blew up not more than 100 yards from the cook tent, didn't know that. When it blew up, it wounded, it killed so many people. By the way, in this war, in the Middle East, there are about 6,000 who have been killed. There are about 50,000 who have been physically wounded and about 400,000 who have come back with mental disorders, PTSD, and the like. So even non-combatant secretaries were called upon to ride in convoys and, and hold the weapon and go shotgun. And, and they were non-combatants. And then there are non-combat related experiences. We all know about those. Uh, on the deck uh, of an aircraft carrier, uh, people can get killed by being sucked into the, to the intake of a jet engine or fires amongst, uh, uh, among board in it. And as well, the sexual assaults that we've been hearing about. The condition is adversely affected by other things like repeated deployments. You know, this is the first war in the history of modern warfare where people were called back to the same combat zone over and over and over again. In World War II, you were there for as long as it took, two years, three years, four years, but once it was over, it was over. You came home. That was it. In Vietnam, it was 12 months, 13 months if you're a Marine, because they're a little tougher. Uh, that's where the term short-timer comes from, by the way, the Vietnam War, because you had 12 months or 13 months, and then when it was over, you're finished. You're done. In this war, I've personally seen veterans who have been back seven times. We don't know the, the impact of just that going back to the combat zone over and over and over again. Repeated separations from one's family. This is, this is unique as well, by the way. 
This is the first war where they've had Skype and internet. So a soldier can be talking to their family and 30 minutes later have a suicide bomber blow themselves up and kill many of their friends and it's different, difficult. But separation from family is very difficult. The divorce rate is very high amongst military and veterans. Dwell time. So dwell time is the time you're here between deployments. It's supposed to be twice as long as your deployment time, but in many instances now, it's half the time of the deployment time, and it's not very successful. Why? Because the, the military combatant is waiting to go back. So they're trying to get into the family mindset, but their minds are trying to get prepared for the next time, and so dwell time may be ineffective. And then we've all seen the data. I'm doing a webinar on Tuesday. The second I've done for human resource people all over the country in terms of hiring vets. Uh, unemployment is high. Finances can be a problem, and health issues are a problem. At the beginning of this war, we had learned our lesson from Vietnam. Remember in Vietnam, soldiers came back and were spit upon and cursed at and called baby killer. We learned the lesson, the DOD did. So this time there were yellow ribbons in the airports and we patted the vets on the, on the back and welcomed them home and thanked them for our service. Uh, but that was fairly short-lived. This has been a long war, uh, over 10 years. And now you don't see many yellow ribbons at the airports anymore, and there's not as much social milieu and support, and I'll talk about that later. But the biggest misconception of all about PTSD is that PTSD is a psychiatric condition. Now, why is that a problem? Isn't it? I mean, it's in DSM-5 now. Why isn't it? I remember the story, I'm an addictionist, and I remember the story of the drunk who's uh, looking in a lighted parking lot, and somebody comes along and says, hey dude, he said, what are you looking for? And the guy says, my geese? And the guy says, well, where did you lose them? And he says, about two blocks back there. And he says, why are you looking here? And the drunk says, because the light's better here. <laughs> the light's better here. When PTSD was codified in, in DSM, it was to help the Vietnam vets who were coming back from Vietnam with this condition that people didn't understand. And since most of the symptoms were psychological, emotional, or behavioral, it was called a psychiatric disorder. We didn't realize then that it's actually a psychoneuroendocrine disorder, and I'll explain that in just a moment. And that's important for veterans that you're going to work with, that they understand that at its core, it's a biological condition with behavioral, emotional, uh, and psychological symptoms. DSM-5 just came out this month. The stressor criteria vary just slightly from uh, what this was. I thought at the time this is what it was going to be and they changed it. Uh, so in order to have the stressor that causes PTSD, and you all know it doesn't have to be combat related. Seven to eight percent of the civilian population suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And women, the most common cause is sexual uh, assault. In men, it's violence uh, of some sort. So you had to have experienced or been exposed to a stressor, an event that threatened your very life or threatened you physically, or they added in DSM-5, threatened you sexually with sexual violation. And in DSM-5, it says you could have experienced it personally. You could have witnessed the trauma in someone else. You could have learned about the trauma in a close friend or family member. Or, or you, would have, you could have had repeated exposure to the trauma. And that was for first responders and others who had to write reports and look at all these pictures over and over again. And as a result, there are four clusters of symptoms. 
One is persistent re-experiencing, unwanted intrusive re-experiencing. The second is called avoidance, which means a conscious effort to stay away from stuff that reminds you of the, of the uh, trauma. Number three, negative changes in thoughts and emotions that weren't there before the trauma, and that's important. If someone was a jerk before the trauma and is now a jerk, uh, that, that's not PTSD symptoms, that's being a jerk. But, but if they were friendly, outgoing, whatever, before the trauma, and now they're a jerk, it may well be PTSD. And the final cluster of symptoms is called arousal. And arousal is what we typically think of as PTSD. So let's look at each one of those. The recurrent experiencing, the re-experiencing, intrusive, unwanted, repetitive thoughts about the trauma. You can't get them out of your head. And uh, recurrent distressing dreams about the trauma. And a dream that occurs when you're wide awake is called a flashback. So a flashback is more than just remembering, it's actually re-experiencing it. So for that moment, you're here, but you're in your mind, you're back there. That's what a flashback is. An intense physiologic or psychologic uh, uh, distress and exposure to things that remind you of the trauma. I'll show you what all that is in just a minute. This re-experiencing can be really traumatic. This is a video of my good friend Lee Alley. Lee Alley was one of the most decorated veterans during Vietnam. He received the award right under the Congressional Medal. Listen to Lee. I commanded reconnaissance platoon of 35 hand-picked men. And as I looked at them, my mind said, who will survive the night? They are warriors and we were warriors. Somebody is not going to survive the night. My thoughts were suddenly brought back to instant reality as I heard the thump, the thump of the mortars as they left the tubes. The mortar attack had begun. Once the attack began, it was an all-out frontal attack. There must have been at least 200 of them as they came upon my defensive position of my 35 men. And then the silence is broken by the screams. And as the Viet Cong yelled, G.I., you die. G.I., we will kill you tonight. And then my body is soaking wet. My body is wet, and as I touch my body, it's the blood. I look to my left, my radio man is shot through the head. I look to my right, my other radio man is shot right through the chest. And oh my God, I am soaking wet, and I can't get the blood off of me. And the sounds and the smells. And then just as sudden, it's over. It's quiet. Because you see, that battle wasn't 40 years ago. That battle could have been two nights ago. And that battle wasn't in Vietnam. That battle was in the comfort of my own bedroom where I should be secure. That's how extreme a nightmare is. And imagine having that nightmare once, twice, five, seven times a week for 40 years. And waking up in the middle of the night soaking wet. And what spouses tell me is he or she screams and yells in sleep. It's fascinating. In REM sleep, which is where nightmares occur, you're supposed to be paralyzed. But, but in nightmares related to PTSD, they're screaming and thrashing about. And frequently, the thrashing is so extensive that the spouse refuses to sleep in, in the same bed or bedroom as, as a result. Avoidance. Avoidance is the second cluster of symptoms re-experiencing is the first. Avoidance means a conscious effort to avoid people, places, things, thoughts, sensations, times, dates, whatever. And sometimes, and I'll explain in a second, it makes no sense. Because the things that are avoided seem nonsensical. A crowd, 
cars following too close, a piece of trash on the road, a, a screaming of kids. And these are the things that often those with PTSD will avoid. And then there's the negative alterations in thoughts and emotions. Decreased interest or participation in activities. Veterans will say, I used to love to go with my family. I went to my kids' games. I used to take my wife to the movies and out to eat. And now the spouse says, he never goes anywhere. He never goes anywhere. And the common statement that goes, I ask the spouses, so tell me, in the last month, how would you describe your spouse's moods using one word descriptors, as many as you need? Loving, warm, kind, gentle, uh, distance, detached, depressed, angry, irritable, pessimistic, optimistic. How would you describe them? And the one word besides anger, and I'll discuss that in a minute, that keeps coming up, is detached. Detached means they're here, but they're not here. They're somewhere else. They just don't seem to be with us. Pervasive negative emotions and very few positive emotions. When I talk to HR people and business people about hiring vets with PTSD, one of the examples I use is they don't laugh at funny jokes. And they don't want to go to, to the company picnic with all the other people. That's distancing and negative emotions. Inability to recall a part of the trauma, I'll discuss that in a second. Persistent, distorted, self-blame uh, about self and others. And negative emotions, not trusting anybody else. And then the arousal symptoms are the ones we all, we all know about, irritability. It's not really as much anger as it is irritability, agitation, and explosiveness. It's not that they're necessarily angry all the time, but they explode at stuff they shouldn't explode at. Difficulty falling or staying asleep, even in the absence of nightmares, exaggerated startle response, so that they hear a noise, that they see something that they don't expect, and they startle. And I think that the, the most poignant example was a a big, burly Vietnam vet, Hispanic fellow. And I said, what startles you more than it should? And he said, I've never told anybody this stuff. He said, I was babysitting my three-year-old grandson. He said, and my grandson came up behind me and put his hand over my eyes. You know how kids do. And all of a sudden, the tears start streaming down his cheek. And he had this frustrated, frightened look. And he said, and I took my arm because I was so sorry. And I did that. And as I see this little kid hitting the wall with his eyes this wide, I thought, what's wrong with me? That's the startle response and the amount of it. Hypervigilance, not wanting to sit with one's back to the wall. That's why we called our book that. Uh, and difficulty concentrating. So from, a, so from a physiologic standpoint, what's happening? This is how we explain it in the book to patients. I'm going to come back to that. It's upstairs, downstairs, and basement. But here it is. So the prefrontal cortex is likened to the CEO of a company, smart dude, uh, he, he talks well, he thinks well, he thinks things through, he uses old equipment, but it's very fancy, and he's up in the big suite at the top of the building. That's the prefrontal cortex. In times of crisis, he's too slow. So what takes over is the limbic structures, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, uh, and, and to some extent, the hippocampus. So the amygdala is like the alert response system in the brain. You hear a noise, and, and the CEO is thinking, so is that at the top of a building? Is that an assailant? Is that an IED? Is that a piece of trash? Is that kids playing? What the hell is it? It's too late. If it's an assailant, you're dead. So the, the limbic structures take over. The amygdala starts the response like that. 
Now, it doesn't matter to the limbic structures if it's right or wrong. So if it turns out it's not an assailant, big deal. I've still protected the body in case of harm. So the amygdala sends the alarm out and sends it to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus sends messages through CRF, corticotropin releasing factor, to the pituitary, uh, resulting in the re release of adrenaline and cortisol. And at the same time, the locus ceruleus in the brain releases norepinephrine into the brain up and down. Now, what's supposed to happen is that the cortisol results in a negative feedback loop that shuts the process down when the stress is over. But in PTSD, that's not what happens. The process continues. It is, in fact, a distortion and a prolongation of a process designed to keep us safe in times of threat that continues to result in a response at times when no threat then exists. So let me go back to my example. This is how I explain it to patients. So we got the CEO up here. He's cut off the limbic structures. The risk alert manager is doing its thing, going out, sending messages to the hypothalamus to release chemicals. The basement, we call it the janitor. That's who releases all the chemicals and does all the stuff that results in the symptoms we have. So here's on the roof. Here's the noise. And, and the limbic structures are going. And the person has the, the, the responses. The eyes dilate, the skin becomes uh, uh, kind of clammy because the blood is shunted down to the big muscles so we can get away. Uh, the heart rate increases, breathing increases, and so forth and so on. Now, what we know. Now, at the same time all that's going on, the hippocampus is the memory center in the brain. And it is recording with infinite detail everything that's occurring. And in times of stress, that's what happens. Everything that's occurring uh, is being recorded. Why? Because if we're ever in that situation again, we want to know it. We want to recall it like that. So it's all being recorded. Now, what about the CEO? Well, he's slow, man. He's got slow equipment. So not all the message from the hippocampus, not all the memories are getting up to the CEO. It comes in bits and pieces. That's what nightmares are. Uh, 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 the body trying to make sense of it. We call it consolidation, but it doesn't happen well. That's what uh, flashbacks are as well. So there's certain parts that uh, the CEO doesn't do. Now let's go to Home Depot. So the veteran is now working at Home Depot. And there are a group of, of kids making noise. And the hippocampus says, hey, we remember that. And the next thing you know, the amygdala has sent out the, the clarion call, and the veteran is on the damn floor looking up, because that's the response he had when he was in Iraq. And everybody's looking at him and saying, what the hell's wrong with you, dude? What is wrong? There's no threat here. And so it occurs in times when there's no threat that exists. And it keeps on reoccurring. The prefrontal cortex, the CEO, is supposed to shut it down by making sense out of everything. But what happens in PTSD is the prefrontal cortex is hypoactive and the amygdala is hyperactive. How do you screen them? In your office, if you see somebody you think might have PTSD, screen them. First question is, have you been in the military? Have you ever been in the combat zone? Or if you think PTSD exists, here are the four questions. And the four questions are all only the four clusters of symptoms. So have you had any experience that was so frightening, horrible, upsetting that in the past month, you, A, had nightmares about it, or thought about it when you didn't want to. Two, you tried hard to avoid thinking about it. Number three, you were constantly on guard, watchful, or easily startled, the arousal cluster. And the fourth is that you felt numb or detached from others and activities. And that's especially a problem for those returning. You know, on TV, we see those wonderful reunions 
where the veteran comes back or the military member comes back and, and surprises the kids at the basketball game or, or the, the, the wife jumps out of the, the box and surprises the family. We never see what happens after that. And what often happens after that is detachment. So one of the complaints from kids of those with PTSD is, I don't know what happened to her or him. They used to love going to my ball games. Why do they go to, why don't they go to the ball games? Because there's noise around. There's people around. And they don't want, it's not they don't want to be at the ball game. They don't want to be around a lot of people. In Iraq and Afghanistan, if a car was following too close, it could have been loaded with a suicide bomber or explosives and kill you. So they don't like to be in, in, in crowds or with uh, a lot of stuff going on on the roads. Loud noise, especially screaming of children, often occurred after the suicide bomber or after the mortar attack, and that will set it off. So kids screaming and playing may do it. A piece of trash on the side of the road may mean nothing to you and I, but in Iraq and Afghanistan, that could have been covering a bomb, and so it's avoided. If you really want to do it scientifically, there's a thing called the PCL checklist, the post-traumatic stress disorder checklist. It's a 17-item questionnaire, zero to five points, it goes to 85. Greater than 50 is considered diagnostic. And I've actually given you a link. If you want to download the PTSD screen or the PCL checklist, they're in the public domain, you can do it. Problems for us as physicians. Patients don't come in saying, I got PTSD. They may not even tell you they've been in the military. So what do they complain about? Insomnia, irritability, pain, erectile dysfunction, sexual dysfunction for women, GI distress, dizziness, headaches, especially if they have concomitant traumatic brain injury, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, trouble with concentration or substance abuse issues. And they don't even say, we've been in the military or we've been traumatized. So you have to ask the question. So what often happens is they get treated with a treatment du jour. 